uh, won competitions, they were, were they more important when you, for instance, won the uh, uh, Queen Elizabeth competition than they are today? Uh, they probably were, because there were fewer of them. I'm sorry, sorry, just one more second here, just, just a second. Okay, with all this high tech, are we ready? Okay, go ahead, sorry. You could just give an answer, Mr. Russian. Uh, they probably were more important then, because there were very few of them still. Um, but in the, in the intervening time, I think there's so many new competitions sprung up that there is a certain feeling of devaluation and inflation <laughs> for competitions. Um, but yes, then they were very important. And also the Tchaikovsky competition then was a new one, and it attracted particular attention of the musical world. Now, in 1962, uh, when you tied with, with Ogden, right. that was, uh, people were, were shocked because you were already, from 1956 on, you were already uh, a famous musician. Uh, did you resent entering that competition? I was blackmailed into it by the Soviet authorities. Um, uh, I married a foreigner, um, an Icelandic girl, and also after my first American tour, which, which took place in 1958, um, I was on the report of my companion during the tour. Um, I was labeled anti-Soviet and prevented from going abroad. So these two points combined uh, prompted the authorities to blackmail, into, blackmail me into entering this competition because they, at that moment, they didn't have kind of um, um, real prominent talents to enter the competition. So they tried to gather up anybody they could. And they said to me that unless I participate in the competition, I can forget about any career, uh, trips abroad or even in the Soviet Union. So I really had to do it. So I was really under great pressure uh, entering it, playing, and uh, I didn't know if I would win it, uh, not at all. And the Tchaikovsky piano concert is not exactly my piece, uh, but somehow I survived. So I'm, I'm delighted I shared the first prize. Could have been worse. Could have been. Sure, you never know. Um, you won the second prize at the famous Chopin competition in 1955. You were, you know, nothing more than 19 years old. How, how no, I was just under 18. Really? He was yeah. even younger. Yes. The pressure on such a, uh, really almost a, just a teenager must mm -hmm. be incredible. What about in, in your career since? What have you felt that, has this pressure been good for people in the long run or bad? It depends on the individual. Uh, when you're very young, sometimes you're not aware of the pressure. You don't even know sometimes what pressure is. You just come onto the stage and play, um, and maybe play your best sometimes. When you begin to know what pressure is, and that is when it can hamper you. Uh, and in fact, in that particular competition, I already had uh, my first taste of, um, of being affected by pressure. Because in the first two rounds, I played my best, basically, and by the points, I was number one after both first and second rounds. And I felt that so much was expected of me in the third round. And also the Queen Elizabeth of Belgium, Belgium came, Belgium, damn it, excuse me, came. And then Arthur Rubinstein came for the finals, and uh, it was sort of a big occasion. And I felt terribly exposed. I felt I'm number one and I have to play like number one, and I didn't play so well. So in the end, I received the second prize. And Adam Harasevich played very beautifully in the finals, so he was the first. <laughs> oh, that was the Chopin, yes. yes. And then there was a very big competition between you and uh, the American John Browning in the uh, Elizabeth one. In the Brussels competition, oh. yes. Um, and I, I thought he was wonderful. I thought, I, I thought that John actually will win the competition. And, um, that made me feel very carefree. I was absolutely sure he was playing Brahms too, and his junior was a wonderfully interesting pianist and very accomplished. I thought, well, I have no chance in any case. So I played my best all three rounds, because I didn't care at all. I had no pressure on me. And when they announced that I won, I couldn't believe it. 
I just couldn't believe it. Actually, there's a photograph that was taken at the moment of announcement that I got the first prize. And my face looks so surprised that it's almost like a comedy. It's like a beauty competition. Yeah. The, all of a sudden, the, the, the beautiful woman who thought she was not going to win wins, yeah. and it's incredible. But yeah. that's a deep psychological insight because um, uh, pressure is such a vast thing on playing. But now let's get to something really important. What, what is this idea? And it's permeating the society more and more uh, because it's such a competitive society that piano playing, art in general, has to do with competition is a, uh, a rather defeatist point of view in the long run, isn't it? Yeah, so there are many angles to it. There is no one answer to this question. There are some positive elements in it and some extremely negative. Uh, generally speaking, art is not subject to competition, as you of course know. Um, interpretations and the view of the pieces that you play, views, in fact, of the pieces that you play, can be um, equally valid, equally convincing, and not um, subject to competition, not subject to being labeled that this is the best interpretation, this is number two interpretation, and so on. Um, uh, but um, that wouldn't answer the question because um, there is a very strong sporting element in competitions because it's not just art but there is also skill a skill of handling a monstrously difficult instrument like the piano like the violin cello and so on and very often in fact the judgments are based on how uh, well you control your instrument rather than how good an artist you are um, and very often trying to um, find the balance between um, artistic achievement and instrumental achievement. Uh, trying to, no, I would, say, I would rather say trying to base your judgment on the com combination of the artistic achievement and instrumental achievement offered by young artists. Um, jury members find it very hard, in fact, to find a satisfactory basis for judgment. And very often, more often than not, the judgment is veered towards, um, towards thinking of the instrumental achievement rather than the artistic achievement. Because it's much easier to say that somebody played, just played better, played all the notes better, uh, better prepared. It, it's easier to judge that than to judge validity of an interpretation, especially if the competitor wasn't particularly well prepared, that some passages didn't come off so well. And one can always uh, say, it's an easy way out, say, oh, well, he just didn't prepare so well, so we can't really consider him seriously. Uh, therefore, one should always remember that finally, uh, when you judge a winner or the first three or four, so to speak, best uh, people in the competition, it's only relative, a, a relative judgment um, for this particular, particular group of people at this particular time in this given competition. Um, it's by no, mean, by no means necessary that you will find a great talent in a given competition. You're just judging who was best prepared for this particular competition, and that's it. That doesn't mean that this winner or number two or number three will become um, great personalities, great artists that have very much to offer. It's only a judgment of that particular competition. So it's very difficult to say how important competitions are. I think they are important when there is a really huge, great talent, like the first Tchaikovsky competition where there was Van Kleiburn, who was heads above anybody else in the competition. And it was wonderful that we could have somebody like that and give him a first prize that uh, no one had any doubts about, and give him a push straight away to the highest level of concert platform. That's wonderful. Then one feels that that competition was worth having, you know? Otherwise, there's so many, there's scores of competitions. Somebody wins and nobody really cares. He's good, but not particularly good. Oh, he won, he was best of this group of people, but he doesn't have much to offer, we say, you know? So that's why I say that only some competitions are important when there is some great big talent. It's good to have one.
Now, with the inflation, do you think that the opposite will occur soon, that competitions will start dying out? I've never thought this in this direction. It may happen, so history is difficult to predict. They might, they might. You never know. People get bored with things that are too much of a, a good thing in a way. Maybe. Or a bad thing. Difficult to say. I wouldn't venture into predicting. Now, what about uh, your own, well, I'll ask you this. Your remembrance of any juries? Uh, were you, like, upset who's on the jury? Do you think juries are better today than they were? And do you think that really a competition is only as good as its jury? That I can't say. I don't follow competitions today very much. And honestly, I don't know exactly who goes to the jury. I've been invited a few times. I refuse because I have no time and not that much interest. Uh, but I must confess, I finally agreed to go to the next Chopin competition, which is in, maybe you know better, 90, 1990 maybe. Because uh, that was my first competition, and I thought, all right, I'll go there for the finals and uh, kind of nostalgically sit there. Sure. So that's an exception. Do you have any remembrances of your first visits to uh, Brussels or to um, Warsaw? Did you feel, oh, I'm, I'm now in the home of Chopin? Was there a feeling of uh, history for you because you were so young, leaving Russia? Yes, those were my first trips abroad altogether. So they were exciting just for that purpose, if nothing else. And going and seeing the house where Chopin was born was very nice to see the house. It was a very pleasant feeling. Yes, I enjoyed it tremendously. It's so interesting about what you said about John Browning because, you know, you said, uh, oh, you were so convinced he would win. And he said to me, the moment he heard your Chopin etudes, he said, I knew it was over for me. Oh, really? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well. So that's so funny. Yeah. Um, what do you feel, uh, um, you see, you are a survivor of these competitions, but uh, what about all of the people that they win a competition and they're never heard of from again. A management will, will take them and they'll give them their, their one year, and then afterward the management will never care again because they want the next commodity. They don't want to work to build an artist. Somehow it did not hinder you, the winning, but it has hindered actually many people in a certain strange way. Well, you're asking a different question. question. You're asking what is a career? How yeah. do, why and how you make a career? And there is no answer to that. Nobody knows the answer. Everyone says, and I conform to that, that A, you have to have a talent, B, you have to work very hard. But what C is, nobody knows. Uh, because there's so much luck involved, so much of being in the right place at the right time somehow. Did you feel that happened to you, that you were in the right place at times? Maybe. Well, here I am, you know, I made a successful career. And um, heaven knows, I can't put my finger on it. Just to say that's because I'm talented or so on and I worked hard is not enough. There is some other element, there are some other elements that are full of mystery, and they're imponderable. Maybe it's something, your presence on stage, or maybe the way you walk on stage, maybe the way people like you in this particular mm, period of, in our history, heaven knows. I really don't know. But, of course, hearing you over the years, your element of preparation is different, Maestro, than other people. You, you have a security that is, uh, that is just on a higher level. That, that also has to be a part of an of a international world career. Of course. I mean, there's so many people who can play extremely well and also have ideas, also communicate something. And only some of them, for some reason, are liked by the audiences and hailed as somebody special. Uh, sometimes for wrong reasons, sometimes for right reasons, in my opinion. And I can't speak for everybody. Uh, but it is a, it's a mystery. Charisma, whatever you call it. But we simply cannot predict who and why will make a successful career. One hears occasionally that uh, people uh, will play differently for a jury because you have to be conservative in a competition compared to uh, the way you would play in a live performance just in a recital. Have you ever thought of, about that? Did you ever play differently? <laughs> no, I played the only way I knew how to play. <laughs> I didn't think of anything. 
<laughs> do young artists today have any sense of links to the past, in your opinion? You came from a great, great tradition at the Moscow Conservatory, Neuhaus. So many people taught there that, you know, felt the, the going back to Anton Rubinstein. Today, uh, the roots seem to be a little lessened, in my opinion. What, what do you feel? I don't know. Um, my answer to this question is usually that I think that it all depends on the individual. Uh, school or not school, uh, you know, we've had great people like Gilles Richter, and others in the Soviet Union. And um, if, if I had heard Gilles and Richter, not knowing they were f from Russia, I wouldn't have known they came from the same teacher, from the same school, you know? It all depends how you absorb things, what you have in you. Um, that's the best I can answer. I, I don't know a, 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 another interpretation of, of this question or, or an answer. I don't really know. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to just ask you, uh I'm going to list uh, some artists, and if you have any uh, opinions on them, yes. for instance, um, uh, Arthur Rubinstein, did they have any great influence on you? Did they affect you in any certain way? Rubinstein, uh, when I was a teenager, I hadn't heard much uh, of Rubinstein's playing, because he never played in Russia then, and it, it was very difficult to get any records uh, then. In our conservatory, so to speak, discotheque or whatever we called it, phonotheque we called it, there were no recordings of Rubinstein, but there were many of Horowitz, uh, I remember that, and Hoffman, and Rachmaninoff, of course. So those were the pianists of the sort of past and recent past and present that I knew. I didn't know Rubinstein. So at that point, he did not um, form my. Uh, uh, piano outlook, so to speak. Later on, when I came to the West, of course, I heard his playing and I admired it very much. But that was already not in formative years. When you came to the West, in a way, a whole repertoire entered your blood that you, you didn't really have there. That's or true. In a way, you, you, you grew up in a very locked up Soviet Union. Right. Uh, so you couldn't hear many things. No. Uh, Soon you came here, you started exploring the great works of Mozart, and uh, you moved away from the repertoire of the Moscow Conservatory into a grander repertoire, I would say. Well, not so much that I moved away from a certain repertoire. I moved away from a certain attitude to music, I would rather say. My repertoire, when I left the Soviet Union, was embryonic, I would say. A few pieces by this composer, a few by that composer. But it is the mentality, the attitude to music that I had to move away from. Um, because in the Soviet Union, with a, with a very profound indigenous culture that permeates everything and everybody, uh, you can't help but becoming a product of it, and in a way a victim of it, if you look, uh, if you look objectively, not necessarily negatively. Uh, because I think conformity to one way of thought in art is very dangerous. Unless, um, unless you've lived through a long period of your life and you decide to conform for specific reasons, that's something else. But in your formative years, if you know nothing else but a certain uh, and quite narrow-minded way of looking at life and at music, at art, uh, it's very dangerous. And um, I consider myself fortunate and lucky that I found myself in the West when I was 26. So I could just about escape um, one blind alley, you know, and uh, find myself in a free world where I could um, develop my attitude to life. Uh, I would develop as an individual as I felt would be right for me. You would have remained provincial there. Excuse me, we just have to that music had never been heard in Russia, so that was a particular, there was a particular interest for that. But also the way he played Bach um, was so extraordinary, um, especially in the Russian atmosphere, that he became instantly um, a, a star, so to speak, a sensational star. Um, I went to his concerts, of course. I was amazed by incredible 
ordeal control of his playing, and I would say um, rational control, or people say intellectual control, I would rather say rational, that he um, really commanded himself so well and his uh, fingers obeyed his brain so wonderfully and his ears were so incredibly clear that you could hear all the voices and everything and that in itself was a revelation I, I had never heard anybody who could hear all the three or four voices of a Bach fugue so clearly like if they had their own lives uh, so I'll never forget that um, on reflection later I thought that uh, many years later I, I realized that in fact his uh, the meaning of his playing was rather eccentric. But that I realized later. At that point, I was completely overwhelmed by the, uh, what I just described, by the incredible control and presence of mind. Um, but I remained a uh, complete admirer of his um, playing, especially of Bach. And just before he died, he made a television program um, with interviews and a lot of spontaneous playing. He just said, I'll play this fugue now, and he played it. And that playing, I think, was the best Bach playing I ever heard in my life. And that's about one year or two years before he died. I thought that was no longer just audially beautiful, but it was so intense and so meaningful and so simple in a way, and not eccentric anymore. It was just direct from um, one great mind to any mind that could receive the message. That was very special. I'll never forget that television program. So I think, in the end, to sum it up, I think he was the best, he had the best Bach playing that I could ever imagine, but in the last years of his life. Even the last Goldberg compared to the first, you, the, the eccentricity was, was leaving him, and there, there was a mm -hmm. new painful with yes. drawn feeling right. in the theme. More simple, more direct, yes. more economical. So. Mr. Ashkenazi, you have such a gigantic repertory. I know that almost every month at WNCN, more CDs come in, the Beethoven sonatas are now on CDs, the, and, and I have them on all the time. And I, uh, I've all, always marveled, now how did you get almost everything Chopin from, you know, from the funeral march opus 72 mm. to bolero so, i mean you name the piece you have you have learned it you have committed it not only chrysler and not only the major works of schumann schubert mozart uh, the prokofiev uh, concertos the rachmaninoff concertos the etudes tableau, below the list uh, nine or ten transcendental etudes how did you do it you are still a relatively young boy how well, did it happen uh, <laughs> did you work is it is it a constant working Yes, I actually don't do anything except work. I have no, uh -huh. I have no hobbies. <laughs> when I'm on holidays, I practice and study scores. I conduct a lot. Um, but um, my, all my life is focused on my profession. So that's why, in the end, um, um, things like this happen. When I decide to do something, I see the project through to the end. And uh, you know, I thought I have a lot of self-respect for that. No, no, not the right word. Not self-respect. Um, I like to hold my word. So if I, if I promise, I promise the company I do all Chopin. I thought, well, I better do it. So I did it. <laughs> it's startling. I mean, not only that, of course, the ten sonatas with Perlman, uh, a Rachmaninoff song accompaniments, mm. uh, and now you have added, you know, all the orchestras of the world to your repertoire. Sibelius symphonies, I mean, it, it is unbelievable. Now, I mean, you are hardly a, a man that's inarticulate. Do you have any time to read? Do you have any time to, to uh, go beyond any of this? Because it seems already it's five lifetimes you've done. Yeah, I, I, I don't read very much nowadays because all my spare time I, I used to learn scores because I have to build a lot of repertoire in my conducting career. I have quite a sizable one, but still there's a lot to learn. Maestro, it must be a, to put it bluntly, a demonic passion that, that came over you very young to be able to uh, think like this, this kind of focus. It's more than focus. 
surgeons have focused, but I mean, this is... But, um, you know, either you love music or you don't. I think the, the feeling for music is so intense and so encompassing in my life that I can't, you know, when people ask me, for instance, if you play the same or conduct the same piece over and over again, don't you get bored of it? Well, I can't imagine how you can get bored of Beethoven's Seventh Symphony or Brahms IV or Beethoven 110 or something. I just simply can't imagine that. And when people ask me, I don't understand the question because maybe you can get bored of some trivial trifle, you know, yes, maybe, but not of music that has so much to offer that is larger than eternity itself, you know. Uh, you can't get bored of eternity because you can't fathom it in any case. Um, therefore, my answer is I don't understand how you can get bored of it. There is always so much new to find in it because there is no bottom to those pieces, no bottom end. And there's always something new, you find a new revelation, new, maybe not new way of thinking, but certainly another way of approaching this or that angle and, and seeing whether you can communicate more and more of this piece where there is no end of communication. So, you know, when people say, can you be fresh? I say, well, if you feel for the piece, you can't help being fresh and not, not uh, affected uh, by the fact that you played it or conducted it several times already. So that's my answer. I, I don't know what else to say. I think it's just a very intense passion for, for the music you make that uh, um, makes you to go on and on and on. Well, many people uh, love music and many people here at Juilliard practice many hours. Uh, but I don't know that they accomplish much. You must have the secret of proper work. Are your work habits wonderful? Um, I don't know if I have a pattern. Um, if I need to learn a piece of music, I just go ahead and learn it and spend as much time as is necessary to learn it. Um, if it's a piano piece, I just sit and practice until I know the piece. At least I know the piece. Maybe it's not ready to perform yet, but at least I know I've learned it. And then it takes many more hours and weeks uh, before I venture it onto the concert platform and play it and publicly. Then, it, then another life span for this piece begins before I know that uh, now I'm in a re reasonable control of it. <laughs> Total control is almost impossible, but at least I can play it in the major places, you know. The same goes with the orchestral repertoire, except I don't need to sit at the piano. I just, whenever I have free time on the plane or at home, I look at the score and try to absorb as much as I can. While you're on the, pl uh, an international career is so difficult. What, what does a, uh, a, an airplane do to you? I mean, you have to be constantly traveling the globe. Yes. Uh, I've discovered that this is one of the best ways of learning a symphony. If I have a long flight, I certainly will learn one or two movements. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not being facetious, it's really true. Before I didn't know what to do on the planes, read a book or something, yes, of course you can do that. But now I use the time, really. <laughs> a man who knows how to use time is a rare thing in the modern world. Um, but there's something deeper, something wonderful happened to you psychologically that you don't have psychological blocks as you said there's the piece i'm going to learn that i'm going to play that piece uh, somewhere in new york next season and you sit down and do it uh, this is a, a a rare thing many people have many conflicts that they have to work out somewhere in your childhood or in your training there was a, uh, you used the word focus before, there was the ability to give yourself to the music without anything else. The guilt didn't enter, I had to go to church or, or to synagogue or to, I had to uh, do schoolwork. The music somehow just was there for you and you were going to do it. Mm. The conducting obviously has been the same way. Mm. I don't know quite how to 
elaborate on this. I, I don't not remember. You know what no. it is because so many people, that, well, they're procrastinators. Uh -huh. I will learn a piece, uh, I love this piece, but uh, 17 years from now they'll get to it. Oh, um, yes, but um, when you learn a piece, <laughs> um, it's only the first stage. You just have to have some command of it, some control of it, absorb it, get it to your system. Um, uh, if you uh, mean deeper and deeper understanding of the piece, what it is all about, um, that uh, may come, may it may not come. That depends on on you, what you have in you, what what you what you represent in life, in a way. In a way. Uh, but unless you learn it, you can't even begin the first stage. You have to learn. You know, when I began to learn the Beethoven piano concertos or piano sonatas, uh, maybe it was early um, to understand the music. But I thought, why why shouldn't I learn it now? Because in any case, one day I'll have to play it. I might as well start learning it now. And then as you play the pieces many times and over and over and think more and more of it. At least you know you've already played it a few times. And you don't need to think of it as a new piece. The meaning of it, the message of it, is something else. As I say, it may come, it may not. You just have to be um, living with it all the time, thinking about it, and hopefully find something. Now that you conduct, uh, and this feeling of conducting is certainly must be the most awesome color feeling in the world, uh, when you sit at the piano, do you feel now you are working with a, um, a miniature orchestra? I always felt that. I always thought of the piano colors in relation to the orchestral colors. If you only just imagine that some, some voices you play are played by different instruments, not necessarily so, not all the time, but sometimes, quite often, um, I did think like that in the pieces that lend themselves uh, to that kind of thinking. And sometimes I thought of an orchestra in rhythmical terms, when you play a particular rhythmical pattern. Um, it's one thing when a soloist plays a rhythmical pattern, it's another thing when a violin section plays a rhythmical pattern, where it has to be so precise, there's no room for deliberation. Um, and um, sometimes in, uh, especially Mozart, Beethoven, Brahms, when you play certain passages, you think of a symphony orchestra just for this structural uh, pattern of it. And that helps too, very often. So not only colors, but even rhythms sometimes. Um, do that's you the think, answer. Do you have any advice for young pianists in their work habits? Should they... Um, play scales and arpeggios. I find very few people are, are, are playing the basics anymore. Well, if they need to, I think they should. It helps probably to some people. Yeah. You don't work on that kind of thing now. No, it's too late now. I just play the pieces that I need to play. and uh, I could play all the arpeggios and scales now. I know I can play them, so it's no, not necessary to practice. But for some young pianists, it might be a good idea. Okay. Do you think that teaching... Can you really teach a great pianist? Did your teacher, uh, Lev Obron, did, was he in, really influential to you in the long run? Um, well, my professor wasn't that keen on teaching, so maybe we leave him alone. He was a wonderful pianist, a wonderful musician. Uh, but my other two teachers gave me a lot. My first teacher, Anaida Sumbatyan, mm -hmm. and uh, Oborin's assistant, Lev Zemlansky, they gave me very much. But to answer your question about teaching, uh, I think that if I decided to teach, then would, I would have to devote a lot of time and energy and a lot of my mind to teaching. In other words, I don't like to do things halfway. You know, if you begin to teach, then you have to give everything, all of your being, to your students and supervise their development uh, continuously, you so only to have speak. One life. Exactly. I can't do that. Therefore, I decided that if I listen to some student once in a while, I can. I should always warn him that I'm not teaching you with just one time meeting. If I can help you in this one hour or two, I'll give you all I can in one hour, but don't expect that we can really consider ourselves student and teacher. 
that can be developed only over, over a period of time, only if the teacher really gives a lot of energy and uh, all the devotion to this profession. So I don't teach. I'm also suspicious of master classes because, again, you can give so little in one or two hours and then it's finished, you know. So you can't be really responsible for the development of the student. You cannot even be responsible, you cannot even be sure that the student will understand what you try to say in this one hour because you don't even know the person. You don't know how he or she absorbs what you're saying. So that's very dangerous, these master classes. Um, sometimes they might help, sometimes I think they don't help. And what happens is that the teacher becomes the star at these master classes. Whereas the whole purpose of the master class, at least on the surface, is to give the students something to absorb. But again, I'm repeating myself, I'm not sure that they always absorb. The teacher kind of performs in front of the audience and the students rather than really teaches. It's very difficult to teach in one hour. You have to teach over a long period of time, I think. So I don't do this type of thing unless I'm compelled to for some reasons that I can't be in control of. That's understandable. I mean, your talents are, you know, are best serving the world by performing, of course. Um, when you are conducting, now you have played everything from the Scriabin concerto to, the, uh, to, to all the Prokofiev. Um, when someone is your piano soloist, how do you think of them? Do you think of yourself now, uh, your, your playing of it? Is there any... Is there any tension that you uh, feel or...? No, there's no connection, in fact. I separate myself from my view of the piano part. In fact, even from almost from my view of the piece. Because I think this is a soloist prerogative. He or she has to decide how she or he feels comfortable with this piece at this particular moment, at the moment of performance. So my job is to be of assistance to the soloist, to do, to do as well as I can to make the soloist feel comfortable and fit his interpretation in my tutis, in my company, and so on. So I forget how I do it. Even the Scriabin sonatas have been your domain. I mean, you even wrote a preface to Fulvian Bowers, who said, by the way, he was coming to see you today. Uh -huh. uh, so, you know, you have to stay one minute. But um, you never know what he'll do, of course. But um, even the Scriabin sonatas, uh, you play, the last time I heard you play Scriabin was uh, 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 the sixth sonata. Right. Um, right. Carnegie Hall, right. which also did Wonder of Fantasy. And Gaspar, what a program. Now, uh, am I right? Yes, I think so. And Opus and, and three late Scriabin pieces. That was, is, there uh, any, is there any domain that you are now after that you have, uh, for instance, Metner or some composer that you've been wanting to get to or a new enthusiasm? I want to do a lot of Brahms now. I haven't played a lot of Brahms. I want to do the quintet now, trios, the trios. Um, piano sonata I'm doing now this season, the F minor sonata, and some pieces, short pieces that I've never played before. So that's my next venture. And as a conductor, are you not, do you ever feel that it, it hurts your piano playing? As Rachmaninoff once said, he couldn't play for months after he conducted? No, I couldn't play a recital the next day after I've conducted a concert. That's no, there's no problem with that. And in fact, I very often play a Beethoven or a Mozart piano concerto in the same program as I conduct. So I do an opener, then I play a piano concerto, and then I do a symphony. That's not a great problem. What is a little difficult is if you have to play very, a very physically taxing piece after a, a long period of conducting, because the muscles are different that participate in conducting from uh, those muscles that uh, participate in, say, a Brahms piano concerto or Bartok concerto, where you really have to use a lot of physical strength. And that's a little difficult. You have to have relaxed muscles, muscles, and they are not after conducting. So that's a bit of a problem. So I try to have some gaps between a long period of conducting and a piece of this magnitude. So there is a strategy then? There's some, yes. yes. Uh, you look like a man in great shape. Do you find all your exercise in conducting, or do you walk, or do you run, or...? I try, well? try to walk. I, I take care of myself, yes. I don't drink, I don't smoke, etc., etc. Um, I do walk when I can. I do a little bit of 
an exercise every morning, not much.